Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's Daily Global Show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to convene this global conversation around various aspects of the pandemic, the elections, and so much more. Today's episode number 237 in 237 days of lockdown in New York City. It's also the night before the elections in the, in the United States, and we needed a very special guest, and we have that for you tonight. Our guest, a day before the election, is one of the most influential lawyers and people in D.C. Robert Barnett is our guest. He has represented a wide variety of political and media figures, including Hillary and Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and Curry, Wolf Blitzer, among many others. He served as a practice debate opponent for many Democratic presidential and vice presidential candidates. He has worked with so many folks who understand and shape DC and American politics in ways that no very few people do. We are going to meet Mr. Barnett in just a minute. In the meantime, we are going to have him uh, share this with his friends and family, as we would love for you to share with your friends and family. They can watch live or later. We're on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. Hi, everybody. I'm Sri. Thank you so much for being here. I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism, and just delighted to be here with all of you and so honored that Robert Barnett would spend election eve here with us. I'm also the co-founder of DigiMentors, a social, digital, and virtual events consulting company. And we work on virtual events and conferences and talk shows. We've done events for 50 people and events for 100,000 people. We bet our event, we bet your event is somewhere between those two numbers. So if you haven't seen us before here, we've had now 237 episodes, more than a million viewers, and we've had more than 420 guests. And we are archived on youtube.com slash Srinet, and we're in partnership with Scroll Global and Scroll.in. Big thanks to our sponsors and big thanks to our producers, Rose Horowitz at Rose Horowitz 31 and Vandana Menon, Vandana underscore Menon. So right now, please tag your friends. They can watch live or later. Please ask your questions of Mr. Barnett, who will share uh, what he has learned and what he has been doing in so many years of the highest levels of work in Washington, D.C. So I'm ready to uh, meet him, and I know you are too. So everyone, please say hello to Robert Barnett. Hello, sir. Hello, Shri. Nice to see you. I must say I'm the visiting professor of nothing, but I'm glad to be visiting with you. Very kind. Thank you. My first question, even though I have so many other things to ask you, how are you? Where are you? And how is your family handling the pandemic? How have you done through all of this? Very nice of you to ask. Um, our law firm is shuttered, as just about every law firm is. We're all working from home, doing our business, very busy. I uh, go into the office a couple times a day. It's a couple times a week, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a ghost town, never see anybody, but it helps me to be able to print and get some files. Uh, working from home, as you can see behind me, uh, keeping keeping business alive. My uh, daughter, son-in-law, and three fabulous, wonderful, loved grandchildren are all in New York in school, in person. Uh, we got to spend a couple distinct months with them during the summer, which was a real blessing. My wife's also working from home, and uh, we're just waiting for the vaccine. Yeah, I mean, we, we all are, but we're just glad to hear your family's doing okay. Uh, I'm in New York, so uh, we I'm sure like the rest of the world you watched as New York became you know, the the epicenter of, of the virus in the U.S., and now it has spread to other places, and New York has done pretty well, though there's still obviously too and, many people and, sick. And, and, too many and people. a lot of thanks goes to my client and good friend, Governor Andrew Cuomo, who jumped on it and found a way to get 20 million New Yorkers to go in the same direction and knock on wood, uh, it's been pretty good. And I just hope it can stay that way for the sake of you and everybody else in that great city. Well, thank you. And thank you to Governor Cuomo as well. Uh, we will be uh, talking about many of your clients. We should have people know it is not name dropping when 
Robert Barnett does it because these are people he works with. For the rest of us, it would be name dropping. This is what happens when you have worked in Washington as you have for so many years and have worked at the highest levels in people with people in and out of government on both sides of the aisle. So uh, let's give people a little bit of a sense of some of that work and, uh, and, and the journey that you've had, the incredible journey you've had. Sure. I uh, grew up in Waukegan, Illinois. On Lake Michigan, Lake halfway Michigan, between Chicago, Chicago and Milwaukee. Milwaukee, went to the University of Chicago. Went to the University of Wisconsin for undergrad, where I met my wife, and went to the University of Chicago Law School. I then had the fabulous opportunity of clerking for Judge John Minor Wisdom on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans. Then I had the great honor of clerking for Justice Byron White uh, at the U.S. Supreme Court. I then spent two years working for then Senator Walter Mondale in the Senate as one of his legislative assistants. And then long, long ago, 1975, joined my law firm where I've been ever since, although I've diverted to do various things during those many years. But I've been practicing law at the firm of Williams and Connolly in Washington since 1975 with a whole bunch of wonderful partners and associates and staff who uh, have helped me and everybody else get through this difficult time in the last eight months. Um, thank you for that uh, very quick journey through your career. Uh, tell us about the first time you got involved with helping a presidential candidate. Sure. Well, as I said, I worked for Walter Mondale in the Senate and went to the firm in 75. In 76, Jimmy Carter picked Walter Mondale to be his running mate as vice president. And just about all of us who had worked for him over the years left our jobs, moved to Atlanta where the campaign was based and became for two and a half months the Mondale campaign. Uh, there hadn't been debates since 60, Nixon, Kennedy. And for some reason in 76, they decided to resurrect them. And after 16 year hiatus, there were presidential debates. And for the first time ever, there was a vice presidential debate and I helped prepare Walter Mondale for his debate with then Senator Bob Dole, which was the first vice presidential debate. In um, that during that period, I had the great fortune to put whatever skills I had about debating and advocacy and public speaking to work. And um, ever since then, I've done ten cycles, um, worked on debates in ten cycles since 1976. But the first one was with Walter Mondale back long ago. And that must have been, there's just each time you do these, they, you, must, you must learn a lot uh, as, you, as you proceed from one to another. Uh, tell us about some of the highlights, please. Yeah, well, in, um, in 80, we were gonna do it again, but for some reason, long lost in history, there was no vice presidential debate. In 84, when Walter Mondale was the presidential candidate and picked Geraldine Ferraro as his running mate, the late Ann Wexler and I were asked to run her debate prep team, and we prepared her for her debate with George Herbert Walker Bush. And for the first time, I played the Republican in the rehearsals. Um, I played Bush in the Ferraro rehearsals in 84. 88 uh, helped prepare Michael Dukakis for his debate with Bush 41 and played Bush 41 in those rehearsals. 92 had the experience of a lifetime and practiced, debated Bill Clinton about 20 sometimes as Bush 41, the late Mike Sinar from Oklahoma played Ross Perot. You remember there were three that time around. 96, I was recused because my wife was the CBS White House correspondent. 2000, I played Cheney and helped prepare Lieberman. 2004, played Cheney and helped prepare Edwards. 2008, I worked on 23 debates in the primaries, helping Hillary, playing everyone from Obama to Biden to Richardson to Dodd, and the list goes on and on. And when she dropped out, I helped with the team that prepared Barack Obama for his debates in 08. In 12, I worked on the Obama team again. Uh, in 16, played Bernie in all the nine uh, primary debate rehearsals and then helped prepare Hillary for her debates in 2016 with uh, then candidate Donald Trump. So it's been a long history of playing a lot of people and preparing a lot of people. And each one is different, each one's exciting, each one's important. What's uh, What are a couple of tips uh, that you learned for yourself that made you better and better at this? 
for myself, well, it's yeah. not important about me. It's important about the But no, but therefore made you more useful and helpful yeah. to your Well, client. you know, you come away with some lessons. Uh, one lesson is that you design a process that helps the candidate, not that helps the staff and not that pleases the press, but every candidate is different. With Jerry Ferraro, she was a three-term congresswoman from Queens, and with Bill Clinton, he done all sorts of primary debates. Uh, Hillary, obviously, in 16, had run for president in 08. So you design a process that works, and you try to anticipate not so much the exact questions, but the question areas, the topics, if you will, so you can prepare for them. You prepare for every eventuality. The real test is when your candidate walks off the stage, if he or she says, well, I didn't hear anything on there that you hadn't said to me before. And that's that's the real reward. If that can happen, you know you've done your job. And in the in the process, uh, do you find that candidates are especially nervous, or they really like this the, the rehearsal part, or do they kind of hit their stride uh, on on their on their debate? Do you have to kind of make sure they don't peak too early? Well, every candidate's different. There's no generalizing. As a general principle, as the surrogate playing the role of the surrogate, you just want to pound the crap out of your candidate early on to get him or her to be attentive to the necessity of preparation. And then uh, let us say as time goes on, you ease off and they get better and doggone it if you don't lose bad that night before the debate. I, I understand that. Now we're talking about debates, but obviously everyone wants to talk to you about the election uh, day, day tomorrow, election season, as some people have been calling it. But I do want to ask you, how did you prepare Hillary Clinton for Donald uh, for Donald Trump? Well, I didn't play Trump. I was just part of the team right. that prepared. Uh, we we tried to practice for the strange and wonderful ways that he presents himself and. Uh, have her ready for what came. Uh, every single poll, not the call-ins, but the real polls, found that she won all three debates. And uh, I think that any fair-minded person felt she did. It didn't ultimately matter because the Electoral College got in the way, but uh, we felt very good about those debates and how she performed. We felt we were prepared. We felt we anticipated his behavior. And um, again, the the neutral polls, the scientific polls, proved that out, and and we were pleased. But unfortunately, um, we're not running a campaign for Hillary's second term. I wish we were. And uh, that brings us to tomorrow. Uh, how are you feeling? What are you thinking about? Where you have friends, obviously, who are very invested in both sides of your friends and clients in both sides of uh, various uh, battles at the election. Uh, so talk about tomorrow, please. And um... sure. Well, I'm you know I'm cautiously optimistic for Biden. I know full well that there are Trump paths to victory. Uh, some miscellaneous thoughts. Uh, traditionally, the early voting, the mail-in voting, is overwhelmingly Democratic. I think that the numbers have been humongous. Someone just told me that. We're over 90 million early votes. Uh, if that's true, and if patterns hold, that should be very good for Biden. Traditionally, Republicans are stronger on day of, and we'll have to see if the day of somehow either comes close to or overcomes what probably is a Democratic edge. That's one concern. Uh, the second concern you have is whether the African-American electorate will turn out for Biden. I hope they will. Obviously, there was a fall off from Obama to Hillary Clinton. That's to be expected. The question is, what will it be this time? We don't know. Uh, I have concern about the Latino vote. I think that in places like Florida, for instance, the can't generalize, but the Cuban-Americans and to some degree the Venezuelan-Americans seem to be somehow taken with Trump in a way that's hard to understand, but there you go. And of course that vote is critically important in Texas, in Arizona, Colorado, and the list goes on and on. So we don't know. Uh, I think that the number one issue by anybody's measure is the virus. And it's awfully hard to see how fair-minded people buy into the notion that Trump is selling that we've turned the corner. 
uh, we have not turned the corner. I, I regarded it as significant that just in the last few minutes, Deborah Burks, who uh, has been part of the task force, came out strongly against what the president has been saying. That took a lot of courage and is a very important step in this process. So the number one issue is an issue that strongly favors Joe Biden, who has a plan. And I think everybody thinks we'll look to scientists, not to mythology. So those are some random thoughts. Um, personally, I don't think we'll know the result tomorrow. There are, I believe, 16 states that um, allow ballots postmarked up till election day to be counted. Those might not come in for a few days. There are 10 states, I believe, that don't start counting the early vote until tomorrow. Given the numbers that have been racked up on the board, that could take a while. So unless it's a blue wave, and what do I mean by that? Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina. If you see those go Biden's way, that's probably a blue wave. If they don't, then you have to see if Joe Biden can pick off an Arizona, an Iowa, uh, you know the states. He's got to stay strong in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. If it's close, I think it's highly likely that Pennsylvania will once again be the key. Uh, a lot will play out over the next 24 hours. And as I say, I don't personally think we'll know tomorrow night. I hope we do. Uh, for, for folks who are still trying to figure out what exactly has been happening in the last few days. By the way, we want to uh, hold up that mug again, please. Tell us. Yeah. Uh, this is my oldest grandson, Teddy. <laughs> I also have a mug for Connor, and I also have a mug for Blair. They're, they're uh, my treasured and precious grandchildren. Awesome. And uh, I hope they they get to see that you are showing them off uh, on some of these uh, calls. You, that you're you, you've got to send me a link. So I <laughs> yeah, we'll send you a photograph with that. Send me um, a photo. One one thing that uh, th that I presume your day is like one Zoom call after another, uh, just meetings and talks and yeah, I, client uh, work. Well, uh, here do I have it here? No, I don't have it with me. Um, sure, uh, today I had fourteen separate scheduled calls of one kind or another. Um, that that's you can't anymore do what you usually did, which is call somebody up and leave a message. There are no offices. There are no assistance taking messages people aren't necessarily everybody having their calls forwarded some people listen to voicemail some don't so you really have to schedule calls in my world which is an added craziness uh, and results in a long day but i have a lot to say grace over and a lot of wonderful clients who continue to be my clients during this period and i hope i've been able to serve them well well, you certainly have, and we'll talk about that in, uh, by the way, uh, my colleague Neil is uh, surprised about 14 separate calls <laughs> that you had scheduled to, uh, today. We're going to look at some of these comments coming in from all over the world. People are are, are, are commenting here. I and hope we're going to hear from India. because Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, now it's an hour later in India, so that, that'll be great as well. Jonathan's watching from the East Village, and uh, he has watched 237 episodes in a row. Uh, my colleague Neil Parks watching from Springfield, Virginia. I've been there. I've been there. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Sheena says, uh, "Hi, Bob. Uh, Sheena, oh, Rhodes, my former goodness, chief Sheena. of." Sheena, I remember Sheena well. Hello, Sheena. Nice to be in touch with you. I hope you're well. And Sheena was uh, was my student at Columbia Journalism School. Oh, That's really? How That's how great. That's all the world is. Uh, so, hi, Sheena. Great to uh, see you too. Hello, Sheena. <laughs> Doug is watching from California. Thanks for being a source of stability during these crazy days. Thank you, Doug. And, and Pradnya says, hello from Silver Spring, Maryland. You're nearby, Pradnya. Hello. Yeah. And uh, Jonathan loves the books <laughs> stacked on the steps. Are those all literary clients or some not, of them? Not every one of them, but most of them are. Yeah, most of them are clients. And uh, it's, it's a great place to store books on the way up the stairs. <laughs> And uh, Charles and Mary Cun and Carol are watching from New Jersey. Hello, they're, Charles. They're, they're good friends and also sponsors of the show. He's the author of The Inventor in You, the step-by-step -step guide to your first invention. He's made more than 80 patents. Uh, so he's a cool guy uh, wow. to know and someone who really understands the world of innovation. So that's that's very nice. Let's keep going. Oh, lots of people are... Um, uh, let's see. Do you believe that Trump didn't prepare at all for his? I guess no, this no, 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 no. 
Uh, we know, we know in hindsight that he prepared with Giuliani and Christie because they got the virus preparing. Not, not <laughs> yes. Giuliani, I guess. Not Giuliani, but no, uh, he prepared yeah, in, yeah. in his own way. There is some kind of gamesmanship to pretending like you're you're debating a master debater who is so much better than you, uh, right? You you lower the expectations. I think that happened with Al Gore and George W. Bush, where the, 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 anticip the anticipation game, the pre-debate spin game, is always part of it. Never works. Never has any impact, but it's fun. Uh, you know, you 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 taught us that there were there were some vice presidential election that did not have debates, and you were there at the very first one. Uh, yes. Some really memorable debates, including this time, have been in the vice presidential uh, rather than even the presidential. Yes, I forgot to mention that last time around, I played Pence and prepared Tim Kaine too. I, I forgot to mention that Tim is a, a big hero of mine, and I think so highly of him. And, Worked with him on his debate in 16. Forgot to mention that. Yeah. And uh, again, you could have been preparing. You should have been preparing now for the second uh, uh, Clinton uh, uh, Kane uh, administration. But uh, that is not what that is not what happened with history. Stefan is watching from Ramsey, New Jersey. He's on pins and needles. <laughs> Me too, right? Stefan. Me too, <laughs> Stefan. And uh, Ellen says a big concern is the electoral college. Always is. Always is. You have to, unfortunately, under our system, know that, as with Hillary, you can win by three million votes and still lose the electoral college. That's why you see those maps with the on the cables with the uh, possibilities of how it can play out. you got to put together that magic 270 or you are not president. Yep, and we've certainly learned that. I think the world learned that uh, for the first time in 2016. Uh, Ellen says Cubans are terrified of socialism, which they perceive wrongly as Biden. Yeah, which is silliness, which is just silliness. Uh, Joe Biden is as far from being a socialist as you can possibly be. He's a solid, moderate, progressive who has a track record of 40-some years that you can look at, and the, the notion that the Cuban Americans have to be afraid of him or the Venezuelan Americans. They don't. He's, he gets it. Uh, and I hope they'll see what the last four years have been. You know, people ask me all the time, is this like 16? And it's not like 16 because in 16, Trump was a reality show host and a licensor of his name. This time he's got four years of a record that people can judge and there are people who like him and there are people who are gonna vote for him and so be it, that's the American way. But it's not like 16. It's a completely different election. You got to look at what he's done, particularly in the last year, as this country has faced the triple crises of the virus and an economic devastation that's incomprehensible and, and the focus on racial injustice and social injustice. And you got to look at what he's done and make a judgment. And you can look at Joe Biden's record. I think he's proud of it. Everybody's made mistakes who's been in political life for four years or 40 years, but there's no, there's no real comparison, and I'm obviously biased, but that's my view. Yeah, I, I, can, I can certainly understand that. Uh, Ying Chan is watching from Hong Kong. Extreme high interest in this part of the world. Ying, my best friend in the world, all the way back to two years old, lives in Hong Kong, and um, he's an expatriate that's been there for a lot of years, and Love going to Hong Kong. I'm a scratch shopper, to use the golf term. And so Hong Kong pre-pandemic was my paradise. But I hope you guys are safe there. And of course, Hong Kong is having its own issues and everything that's going on there. I'd never heard the term scratch shopper, like a scratch golfer. You're an yes, expert shopper. I'm so a scratch good. shopper. <laughs> I'm going to borrow that. That's a good term. Uh, Ashok is watching from Kerala in India. Have you been? No, I've never been to India. I, I mentioned to you, Shri, earlier that I have a lot of uh, Indian heritage clients, including the wonderful Indra Nuri, formerly of PepsiCo, the wonderful Nikki Haley, former governor of South Carolina, um, and and others. And uh, But I've never been there. Never been there. Never had the opportunity. No, we, cer we certainly should get you there at some point. Lori White's watching from Rhode Island. Will presidential debates become a thing of the past? No, I don't think so, Laurie. Honestly, I think once we go back to two normal people who will behave, 
uh, I think they'll be still part of the uh, process. I think they can be changed. They can be reformed. I was uh, I served on a uh, task force put together by Kathleen Hall Jamison at the Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania, and there were eight Republicans, eight Democrats. We worked together for months and put together a report, which is online at the Annenberg site. I, I welcome you looking at it because we're proud of it on different things you can do, uh, maybe different types of moderators, not having an audience, which was implemented involuntarily this time. Uh, what's called a chess clock method, the, the way you decide whether third party candidates can participate. I welcome your looking at it. Uh, I think you'll find it interesting. No, I don't think there'll be a thing of the past. I think they'll be reformed. I think they'll be changed. But I think they're an important part of the education of the electorate, which is something we should all be for. Here is the report. And folks can just search Annenberg Debate Report. Yep. And it can show up. And there here are the names. Uh, first is uh, alphabetically, there's uh, Bob Barnett and... Uh, uh, so many Bob, other Bob Bauer, who's a senior person in the Biden campaign, and uh, each one of those names has been amazing participant in the process since '76, and and we came together and reached a consensus which still stands the test of time. It's worth looking at. Uh, I should just point out that Ben Ginsburg is the probably the foremost Republican campaign lawyer. And I presume uh, he is on standby right now with uh, everything that's about to happen. Oh no, no, no! Ben is Ben is dropped out and as you really turned against Trump and wrote a big op-ed in the Post just the other day. No, Ben's. Oh, I missed that. By. So sorry. Thank you for correcting that. But yeah. he is. I mean, he's the one who helped deliver the 2000 results uh, with uh, in Bush v. Gore. He was very much involved. He's been in the Democrat and Republican side for years and years, but he's. He's changed his mind. Go look up at his op-ed in the Washington Post. It's beautifully written and reasoned. I will. Thank you. And that's that's an important correction. Now, so why am you. I telling you this? You should be telling me. This. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I I exactly. We, that should that should be the right way. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's keep going here. Neil says the best debate lines were Senator Lloyd Benson's. You're no Jack Kennedy and Admiral James Stockdale. Who am I? Why am I here? Also, the famous Reagan line about not using. Uh, his opponent's youth uh, and inexperience against him. What are the yeah, other? It's interesting you say that, Neil, because the Benson thing obviously was memorable and devastating. The Stockdale thing was a disaster. <laughs> that was him basically saying, "Why am I here?" Which is sort of like condemning yourself. I, I'm not sure I agree. It's a memorable line, but I don't think it's a useful line. Yeah, yeah. Ellen says, "Yes, Neil. I'll never forget what Benson said. Brought the house down." Uh, Tell me if you if you wouldn't mind a line like that. Is, so people keep that kind of in their back pocket. Do they practice that during the debate? Do they come well, out? During... It, it it varies. Some of it's rehearsed and practiced. Some of it's spontaneous. Um, there had been discussion in the Benson rehearsals about the fact that Quayle uh, often referred to Kennedy, but that, to my knowledge, that specific or my memory, that specific line was not rehearsed. Jerry Ferraro to Bush, "Don't patronize me, Mr. Bush." That was not rehearsed. I'm sure that the Reagan line. I will not take advantage of my opponent's youth and experience was carefully rehearsed. Uh, some of these things are spontaneous, some of them are rehearsed. But I'll tell you something that I think is really important. The shiny object, the funny line, the put down, it's interesting. Uh, it uh, gets attention among the pundits. But this time around, it's going to be different. People are not going to make their judgment on a snappy line or a comeback or a put down or what you said about fracking or this or that. They're going to vote on what their day is like as they're virtual schooling their child, as they're trying to find a job, as they, God forbid, are fighting an illness. That's what's going to decide this election. Not snappy lines, not shiny objects. This is a serious election like we've never seen. And I think that the trauma that this country has gone through is going to be a decisive, if not the decisive factor. I, I, I'm hoping you're right, and I believe you are right. Uh, Stefan says, it's sad, scary, disturbing, and unnerving that everything that has taken place over the past four years with Trump in office, that the race is so tight. This is why the Electoral College needs to be done away with popular vote or bust. 
Yeah, and, there's a lot of people who think it's time to change the system. Hard to do, though. Very hard to do. Um, good thought, and there are a lot of people who agree with you. But changing fundamental underpinnings of our system has proven very difficult. And so I have, I have little hope that it'll change anytime soon. But there's certainly a strong argument for it, and you've just made it. <laughs> uh, folks, I just want to remind everyone to please check out the Democratizing the Debates report from the Annenberg Working Group on Presidential Campaign Debate Reform that Mr. Barnett was part of. Uh, you will learn a lot as uh, I'm looking forward to diving into this as well. So please just Google that and you can see. Uh, Neil says Stockdale's comment was definitely not useful by best. I meant, oh my God, I couldn't believe he said that. I wondered whether he was serious or not. Made him look confused. Yeah, you're right, Neil. It was, and it got played again and again during this cycle as it always does. Um, he, he was, I think he was trying to make the point that he needed to introduce himself, but it was a strange way to do it. And he did it sort of walking around the podium a little bit. It was a classic moment. Your great researchers there will pull up the video any minute. I just know. Yeah. Uh, while we do that, I will ask you about, about that election, the 92 election. Uh, how much of an impact did Ross Perot have? Would Clinton have had a chance to win without Ross Perot. There's been well, let me say something about that. First of all, we're talking about debates. Let me come back to that. Sometimes they make no difference. Uh, in 92, I truly believe, and I think Bill Clinton would agree with this, that the debates, if not dispositive, were critically important to his victory. Because here was a pretty obscure Southern governor who, let us say, had some issues in the primaries. And he presented himself as he was, which was able and leader and smart. And those debates in 92, I think, again, dispositive or pretty close to it. Um, Perot's, Perot's presence was certainly a factor. It's still debated whether he took more from Clinton than he took from Bush. I don't know the answer to that. I think in the end, he probably took more from Bush than he took from Clinton, and he probably was a positive factor in Bill Clinton's victory, which was not by a majority, as you know, it was 40 some percent, uh, but we'll never know. We'll never know. You remember he was in it, then he dropped out, then he came back. Yep. And uh, I think his presence there was probably a factor, but I guess history will have to judge that. Do you think we'll ever have a 19% third party candidate again? Be tough, be tough. I think it's tough to qualify. It's tough to raise the money. It's tough to get in the debates. It's tough to get the media coverage. Um, anything's possible. But I, I, th I think Mike Bloomberg looked at it pretty carefully before he went and, and dove into the Democratic side. And you can't get a guy who's more astute and analytic and able to research than him. And I, I'm told he concluded that it wasn't a viable path or he probably would have done it. So I, I think it's tough. I, I don't think we'll see that again. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. Here is that video. Let's, uh, let's watch it for- uh, Oh, you guys are unbelievable. <laughs> Who am I? Why am I here? That's <laughs> <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> fabulous. And, uh, <laughs> Good for you for pulling that up. <laughs> Well, uh, one of the things that, that I, Dana, I think we got to congratulate her, Rose. Yeah, they're they're working very hard behind the scenes. Uh, one of the things that I do want to uh, also point out was that the debate format that they had with in '92, I think it was the first time we had seen that kind of town hall debate right. where George Bush looked at his watch and right. seemed sort of a little disconnected from all of this. Um, I, I have a political question for you. Everything we read, we hear that uh, George W. Bush. Uh, is very unhappy with Donald Trump. What kept him from saying anything? Uh, that was kind of the final, you know, everybody else said something basically who could have affected the elect, had an effect on the elections. Why do you think he, at the end, he decided to stay out? Don't know. I don't know. And I had to, he's a client and a friend, and I'd be doing him a disservice if I speculated. Everybody has to make their own decisions. Um, everybody has to decide their loyalties and their commitments and their relationships and their beliefs. And I can't honestly tell you why he didn't jump in. I, it's pretty well seen that he's not a great admirer of 
the incumbent president. I suspect that the way the incumbent president treated his brother may be part of that, if nothing else. Yeah. But I don't know the answer. I wouldn't want to speculate. Yeah. It wouldn't be no. fair. Um, it, it, everybody has to make their decision. Fair enough. And of course, with you, it's very difficult because everybody we seem to bring up has been a client uh, of yours. So that's part of the fun talking to you. Not you, though. Not you. You're not a client yet. <laughs> not yet. Uh, let's. Uh, Rose is here. She's got. So I was just the warm up act. The serious, tough questions are going to come okay. from Rose. So she's here with us. Hi, Rose. Rose, can you hear us? Hi, Rose. Fair enough, and of course, with you, it's very difficult because everybody. Rose, uh, hold on, let me just. I think Rose has, has is watching us on on uh, on YouTube. I think oh. that's what she has that there. So let me try one more time if I can. Uh, Rose. Uh, Rose is here. Rose, she, she's got, so I was just a warm up back. The serious tough. Question. All right, so uh, we'll, she, we'll have to bring her bring her back in just a minute. Uh, okay. uh, sorry about that. Fun with fun with tech. Uh, yeah. One of the things that um, I do want to ask you is. Uh, what are the you you name some of the states that you think if if there's that blue wave it will it'll be an early sign. Florida is certainly one of them. Yeah, and Florida, then, North Carolina, and Georgia, which mm -hmm. we'll know pretty early in the evening. Um, not 100% we'll know, but we'll probably know. And if those three, the pick three, go with Biden, I think it's over. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but right, that'll be a good indicator, I think. Otherwise, we're off for. I'm afraid some days. One of the things you, uh, you, we were talking about was the electoral college. We should point out that it would take a miracle to change the electoral colleges, be, uh, college because the very states that benefit from it would have to sign away the right, that right. they kind of this miraculous right they've been given in the first place. Yeah, uh, and, no, highly and, unlikely. Sure. Yeah, with, I, no reason. Why would they? Right? Is uh, is how I see it. Like the so I don't think it's going to happen in our lifetime for uh, for sure. Uh, please talk a little bit about how you got into the literary uh, uh, representation business sure. and uh, and then some of the incredible uh, successes you've had with that. Yeah, you know, uh, as, as I mentioned, in 1984, I um, worked with Jerry Ferraro, and even though they lost, every publisher in New York wanted her book because she was the first woman, and she was smart and funny and beautiful and terrific. And so we met with, I think, 17 publishers. I retained an agent to help because I didn't know anything about it, and we got what was then the highest advance uh, in memoir publishing. Then when David Stockman, you'll remember him, left the Reagan administration, sure. I decided to audition to be the representative. And uh, David hired me and I did that book and that made a new record of the highest paid for memoir. So I'd done one Republican, one Democrat, and I began doing the literary representation. I do the same thing that an agent does with three exceptions. First, I don't charge a commission agents charge a 15% commission. I charge a legal fee as a lawyer does, hourly legal fee. Second, if the client wishes, I am deeply involved in the rollout, how you present the book, what cable shows, what network shows, what podcasts, what streaming, what print, what whatever uh, you do to bring the book to the public. And third, I'm bound by legal ethics, which uh, some agents are lawyers, most aren't. So I uh, began doing the literary representation and <clears throat> have represented on the presidential level, Clinton, Bush, and Obama, as mentioned, and six secretaries of state, seven secretaries of the treasury. I represent the best-selling fiction author in the history of the world, James Patterson, uh, Bob Woodward, who had the amazing uh, book Rage about the Trump administration, and uh, prior to that, uh, another book about the Trump administration, Fear. Um, the Obama memoir is coming out November 17th. Um, James Patterson has about a book a month. Uh, he does a lot of nonfiction now, also some middle school and some children's books. A uh, wonderful person, wonderful writer, has a lot of readers. Uh, he got the award from the Guinness Book of Records for the most number one New York Times bestsellers in the history of the world, um, and many, many other sports figures. And I represent Barbara Streisand uh, in the entertainment side, Herbie Hancock, other people like that on the entertainment side, athletes, uh, not just politicians. 
fiction, as I mentioned, the late Mary Higgins Clark did a lot of books with her. Um, it's a lot of fun, a lot of interesting people, and I love to read. So it's a good thing to get the chance to do. And uh, how did you decide to go the non-commission route? I, I'm now worried about all the money you left on the table, sir. No, I leave a lot of money on the table. I, I think it's fair to charge as a lawyer charges for your time. I, I don't personally feel comfortable taking a percentage of uh, my author's hard earned money for writing books. I, others do. That's fine. That's their business and their client, their clients make a judgment to pay that way. I just thought it was a fair way to charge. And so I've always done it that way with all my projects. And are there other people who followed your footsteps or not to my, not to my knowledge in, in my firm, I have a couple of wonderful partners, Michael O'Connor and Deneen Howell. They charge the same way. They have a lot of great clients and they're stable too. But I, I'm not from there. Maybe others. I'm not familiar with it. I, I think almost all the people who do this work on a 15% commission. Correct. That's uh, that's how I know it. Uh, I, I just to make it clear, I'm not worried for you because I know you've done well. But I hope you're charging a lot per hour for this kind of work because it is so important. Can you tell us the what is the record now uh, for your clients? You mean talk about advances? Yeah, in the advanced category. Never yeah. talk about a client's advances. Um, that but I thought we, I mean, we were hearing some, you were-, oh, you were you, You've heard a lot of things, but that doesn't mean you've heard them from me. <laughs> so, so you will say that it was a record, but you won't say the amount, is that no, correct? No, no, it won't say record, won't say amount. Never, 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 ever talk about my client's advances. They wouldn't trust me if I did. That's for others to speculate on. And there's a lot of press reports about these things. Now, some of them, are public figures, so they have to do disclosures. So in that case, the numbers come out over time. As you know, advances are paid periodically, so they don't necessarily get disclosed in one fell swoop, but they come out over time. Public figures who have to disclose them, that's one thing, but I, I never talk about the numbers. That's not why people come to me, and it's not what they expect from me. Of course, I totally understand. We're gonna try Rose one more time. Rose, let's see if we have you here. Hi, Rose. Hi. Hi. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we have a few more minutes with Mr. Barnett, and I know you have some questions, so I'll step aside so you can ask him. I'm scared now. Is she going to hurt me? <laughs> you should be. You should be very afraid. All right, I'm worried. Yeah, <laughs> I see you're worried. Hi, Rose. <laughs> Hi. Uh, well, tell tell us um, if we look. You know how? Tell us historically uh, how many elections. You know when could when do you think this uh, this election could could go that we won't know the results. We talked about that before you came on. Um, my view is it could either be a blue wave, in which case it's over tomorrow night, mm -hmm. or because of the many states that don't start counting early voting until tomorrow and the many states will allow ballots to come in after election day, we could be in for many days. It's just hard to know. We'll know about this time tomorrow which path it is. Um, hard to know as we sit here today, the night, the eve of, if you will. And how big a chance, you know, with your perspective, with so many elections, is there a chance for uh, civil unrest? I'm not the expert on that. I, I drove downtown Washington today, down 19th across L, if you know Washington, just almost completely boarded up. Uh, tragedy, sad, scary. Uh, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. It doesn't come to that. I think it would just be such a disservice to our country, to obviously the people who will be affected, the shopkeepers, the people who might get harmed. Um, I hope it doesn't come to that. But if you look in Washington right now and you drive down 19th or you drive through Georgetown or you drive, oh goodness, around Black Lives Matter Plaza near the White House, everything is boarded up, including my law firm um, in a six, seven block area. So people are worried. I can't. I'm not an expert. I think in New York too. I looked at pictures today. Bloomingdale's, Macy's, they're all yeah, boarded all up. Boarded up. Chevy this Chase never happened up. in an election that no. in my lifetime. No, never, 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 never. It's it's so sad. I hope I hope it doesn't prove to be true. And uh, from your perspective, um, I I'm uh, created a hashtag called Woman to Follow, which is to amplify the voices of women in social media. Uh, so can you give us some perspective on what it was like for to represent Geraldine Ferraro? In sure. Well, I had the honor of representing the first woman uh, on the ticket and the first woman on the top of the ticket. And 
uh, I sadly concluded from both experiences that there's still a lot of bias in this country against women and against women candidates. I hate to say that because I'm the father of a daughter and the husband of a wife and the son of a mother. And I just, but I, I still conclude that that exists and, and it's, um, it infects our process. I hope the day will come when that won't be the case. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, may she rest in peace, who was a friend, once said, uh, I'm always asked, uh, when will the Supreme Court be truly equal? And I say, when there's nine women. And they say, you really mean that? And she said, well, there've been nine men and nobody said anything about that. And exactly. that's a true story. And I think a great story, not just about Ruth, but about this country. Mm -hmm. um, can you, let's see, reflect on, on the candidacy of um, uh, Kamala Harris? Oh, Kamala, Kamala's been an amazing candidate. She was a great pick by Joe Biden. She's um, experienced before being a senator, experienced as a senator. She's been just a terrific campaigner. I thought she did extremely well in those debates and showed what she had to show, which is that she's qualified to be president if that day were to come. Um, I, I'm very, very celebratory of her candidacy, and I think that uh, it'll mean change and role model for a lot of young girls in this country and around the world, and that's a good thing. Thank you. I, I, I agree. <laughs> I think she did a great I job. I hope you do, or get off the show. <laughs> Um, you were a, when you started, you clerked for, uh, just Chief Justice Byron. No, uh, Justice Byron White. Yes. Oh, yes. Can you uh, tell an interesting fact? Yes. His hearing took 15 minutes. He was seated nine days after he was appointed. It was a different time <laughs> and boy, has it changed. And, uh, what, what made you go this route instead of, you know, um, practicing uh, becoming another uh, chief justice? Me personally? Yes. Well, I've loved the practice of law. I, I have great respect for judges. I clerk for two of the greatest. I have many friends who are judges. But I like, the, I like having clients. I like the advocacy. I like the disputes. I like the negotiations that are inherent in the practice. So for me, that was much more attractive and nobody asked me to be a judge anyway. So I didn't felt like I had to make a choice. Um, and what did you, when you were 10 years old, what did you want to become? Did you know then? Shortstop for the Chicago White Sox when I knew that wasn't in the cards. I always thought I was going to go back and be a high school English teacher actually. Um, I didn't have a grand plan. I just took it step by step. I went from high school to college, to law school, to clerking, to the Hill, to my law firm, and then I never left. I got stuck at the firm for 45 years where I've had the blessing of a lot of diverse matters and clients and a lot of fun and a lot of interesting opportunities. Thank you. So many great comments coming in here and greetings uh -oh, to you. Uh oh, you better tell me what they're saying. Uh, getting, no, hello on the way from the road hearing. to Montclair, New Jersey. Apollo uh, joined us you know, was uh, as a speaker from Las Vegas. I want to ask you, what is a story about Las Vegas that you can share with us? <laughs> uh, I actually love playing craps. I'll admit that. My limit's about like $50 or something. I'm a high roller. I had the interesting opportunity back early in my career of representing the then owners of Caesars. And after one of the board meetings, uh, the owner said to me, where are you going? I said, I'm going to go play some craps. And he just condemned me. He said, don't you realize you can't win? I thought you were smart. Why are you my lawyer? And I learned a valuable lesson, which is never go beyond $50. And and craps is not a game that everybody will know internationally. So what, what attracted dice. you? Dice. You think of it as dice. If, if you know a lot of people call it dice. Uh, it's too it's too hard to explain. We'd be here for an hour and a half, but it's a fun game. And again, if you keep below fifty dollars, you can't win. There's no way to win. It's just uh, the opportunity to play. Well, one of the things I learned uh, that Nate Silver said is that the chances of 
of uh, Trump winning are the same as you rolling a one on a six-sided die. You saw Saturday Night Live. <laughs> the guy rolled one to three times in a row on Saturday. I did not see that. Is that true? Is oh, that what yeah. happened? You gotta watch the skit. He did it. Oh on my God. Saturday. Oh yeah. Now, sure. Oh, why wow. am I telling you this? <laughs> yeah, you you clearly have a law. You you're oh, much wow. more in tune with pop no. culture, politics, no. electoral I information than so I am. I use a flip phone. That's how with it I am. <laughs> but and that's, you know, you're not wasting your time with all this other stuff. I uh, believe and, I believe that to be true. Uh, Can we you know you know you know well, the new deal. I understand you you just made a deal with Hillary Clinton and Spielberg. Oh yeah, that's a lot. That's very interesting. Yeah, um, book uh, book called The Woman's Hour by Elaine Weiss. Not a book I worked on, but a great admirer of Elaine and her book. We uh, Hillary's teamed with Steven Spielberg, and we've sold the rights to uh, Warner Brothers, and it, and CW bought it. It's going to be a series. It's the story of the last state to ratify the amendment that gave women the right to vote. Amazing story of bribery and avarice and politics. And I recommend the book, and I think it's going to be a great series. Thanks for mentioning it. Steven Spielberg partnered with Hillary to put that. Steven, 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 his company partnered with Hillary to make that deal, and I'm looking forward to the results. We really also, what, was the state? what was the state, by the way? What's that? Which was the last Tennessee, state? Tennessee. Tennessee. We also had great fun a year ago putting uh, James Patterson and Bill Clinton together to write uh, The President is Missing, which was the number one novel of 2018. Next year, we will be coming out with the second Bill Clinton, James Patterson book. It's called The President's Daughter, and we'll leave it at that. It is a terrific read. All right. I'm going to uh, just read a couple more of the comments here. Uh, sure. Stephen says, I'm curious if, Mr. Bar curious if Mr. Barnett has watched The Way I See It with Pete Souza. The director of it was a guest on our show. Don Paul Porter was a guest on our show. I haven't, also seen, I haven't seen it, Stefan, but I'm a big admirer of Pete's and I will see it, but I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard it's terrific. And Sheena says in your list of clients, you should mention Amanda Knox as well. Yes, I, I represented Amanda after she came back uh, from her unfortunate and unjustified prison term in Italy. And uh, we did her book deal and a few other things. And uh, she's now married and living in the Northwest and, and happily a free person. And the International Court of Justice actually ruled against Italy and gave her damages, proving once and for all that it was an unfounded charge and an unjustified conviction. All right. Uh, Ellen says, this country does not want a woman as president today, 2020. That's Ellen's view? Yeah. I mean, she's she's saying this is what how the country oh, oh, is misogynistic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I told you earlier what I thought. I think there's still an, an, a strong inherent bias among some people that's unfair. And I hope the day will come when that is not the case. But it's certainly still a factor in our politics, as are other discriminations and prejudices. We could talk about that a lot, um, it, but right now I we have we have the opportunity to elect a terrific woman as vice president, and I'm hoping for that. I should I should also mention that one of my guests on our show was John Zaccaro Jr., uh, the son of Geraldine yep. Zaccaro, and he has some wonderful stories about about that period of, of when uh, that amazing summer when. His mother ran. Yeah, uh, and he was. Uh, he and uh, Laura and Donna, his sisters, were around all the time. Got to know them. Jerry and I shared the same birthday, and every year when she was alive, we exchanged greetings on that day. And since she passed away, I always try to message the three kids and John Senior and say happy birthday to the memory of that wonderful lady. And we share a birthday. And happens to be of all things, Women's Suffrage Day too. Oh, <laughs> nice. Uh, Rose, go ahead. We only have a couple more minutes. Yeah, we asked you before, you know, who is, um, who is the most nervous candidate you coached? They're, they're not nervous. By the time they get to that, um, I, don't, I don't see any of them as nervous. They're anticipatory and they're excited, but I like to think they've all been well prepared and not nervous. I wouldn't say they're any nervous. Was there was was it different for Geraldine Ferraro as the, the first um, vice president? Oh yeah, well as you and I have discussed, uh, she had the 
aspirations of a whole lot of the women of America on her shoulders. And that's a heavy weight being the first woman. But she acquitted herself so honorably and so well throughout that debate. And uh, I was proud to be a part of that first. Awesome. I have to say, I watched the um, the series, the Hillary series, and I thought it was really insightful. Yeah, I, I actually had the fun of putting that together yes. with the producers and and um, it just it just was a terrific four part series that started out as really just focused on the campaign, but became a real bio. And a lot of people who don't necessarily care for Hillary's politics, who are friends of mine, watched it and thought it was an amazing piece of documentary filmmaking. It captured that campaign. People are always interested in that going all the way back to the war room about Clinton and Stephanopoulos and Carville in 92. This was a really wonderful examination of that campaign, but also of her life and her career. And I recommend it's on Hulu. I recommend it to anybody as they're staying at home at night with looking for something to do. It's a great opportunity to watch something good. Again, whatever you think of the politics, it's a great No, and, and I think I, I'm one of um, my friends who watched it with my daughter during the pandemic. Uh, and I think that people who know her now and didn't know who she was then, it's very you know illuminating to see what um, uh, you know a pioneer she was. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes left here. Uh, Stefan asks a very uh, non-political question, but an important question. So, Mr. Barnett, what is your favorite restaurant in Washington? And oh, wow, well, that's hard. We, uh, his is uh, Haleo, I think, uh, owned by uh, Chef Jose. Yeah, I certainly know that one. Uh, we go to Cafe Milano. We go to Pica Cafe. We go to Matisse. We go to um, Dumplings and Beyond. We go to, um, th those are ones we go to a lot. Now, this is pandemic where we're doing mainly carry out. When the opportunity to go back indoors comes, we'll be going to a lot of different places that aren't necessarily right near where we live. But uh, right now we're mainly doing carry out or outdoor dining when the weather permits, we're still not doing indoor. And in, in terms of tomorrow, can you tell us what is your, like, do you have an election night ritual or a new ritual because of the pandemic? What are you yeah, going to be doing? I put on my pajamas and watch all the cables and all my clients uh, and telling me what I need to know and hoping for the best. Uh, I think I mentioned to you, I've done 10 of these and won four, lost six. It's a lot more fun to win. I certainly believe that. Sheena says Cafe Milano. I second that. <laughs> they, have, they have one of the best outdoor setups of anybody uh, with the restaurant heaters and the little booths. And you feel really comfortable and safe there. And uh, the people there are just wonderful. And so we enjoy going there. I uh, want to try to patronize these restaurants, keep them alive, because so many have closed and will never come back. So we're trying to help our favorites. Uh, I can name you 10 others, but those are just a few that we try to go to. Yeah, I can, I can uh, imagine that uh, the, the restaurant business is such a big part of D.C., right? Yeah. Sheena, get Carl and come back to D.C. when the pandemic's over, please. All right. So I have to ask you this. How do you maintain your amazing relationships on both sides of the aisle? Rarely do you see people who have uh, business uh, friendships at this level on both sides. Well, when you go to a dentist to get your tooth pulled, you don't ask whether he or she is a Republican or a Democrat. You ask, can you pull my tooth? And I have found that it's the same way with legal services, that most people want someone who can do the job for them. I hope I am able and have proven that I'm able. And so they don't tend to care in the professional side, whether I'm a Republican or a Democrat. I'm obviously transparent. Everybody knows who I've supported and who I've worked for. So nothing's being hidden. But I hope they come to me because they think I can perform the task, whether it be a negotiation or a litigation or an advocacy or a government investigation, whether our firm and my partners and associates and I are faced with. And so I've been able to do that. And that's a blessing because a lot of people who I profoundly disagree with politically are friends. And it turns out they're really good people. And I enjoy arguing with them. But uh, the purveyors of hate are not the ones that I tend to associate with. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I'm, I'm reading this book 
uh, about Bill Campbell by uh, by Eric Schmidt, you know, the uh, the former chairman of Google. And oh, Bill, sure. Cam Bill Campbell was an amazing uh, person who was, uh, a, who was a former director of marketing at Apple and then went on to become a very successful CEO whisper in, in Silicon Valley. And what I, I, I have a feeling you're like him in the sense that people came to you for their, your, your advice and they didn't, you know, it didn't matter whose side or, who, you know, whose interests uh, he always looked out for the interests of the people he worked with. You know, I, I was mentored by our founding partner, the late Edward Bennett Williams, who was probably the greatest lawyer of the 20th century. And he w came to be known as the man to see. And I'm not that. I wouldn't, wouldn't <laughs> flatter myself by saying I am. But some of the great lawyers, the Clark Cliffords, the Lloyd Cutlers, the Edward Bennett Williams, the names go on and on, Harry McPherson. They were people who could navigate through the corridors of Washington and help people with whatever problems they had, irrespective of their politics. And I aspire to that every day. Well, we know that you've certainly uh, achieved that, the ability to be the man to see, the man to get things done. Rose, a final comment or question? Uh, do you, How do you usually watch the debates? If you know tomorrow it's going to be in your pajamas. <laughs> in my the pajamas, watching at home with my wife. and switching around and seeing what the big boards say. And also it's not just going to be presidential. I'm going to watch a lot of my friends who are in Senate races, friends who are in house races. Uh, a lot's going to be uh, the success. If Biden is to win, uh, will have a great dependency on how the Senate goes. So I'm going to be watching the whole picture, state legislatures, everything. I, I, um, again, I don't know if we're going to know the results. People have to be patient. People have to understand that the laws of these states differ and they have to follow the laws, but it's going to be a fascinating night. And I just hope it's a peaceful night, a peaceful night, all of us. And, and the, in the days to follow, well, of course, uh, I also have to ask you about the Senate and, and, and Congress uh, and the House of Representatives. Where, where do you, do you think that there's a chance that this could uh, that they could grab all three. The I, I think that the Democrats will increase their majority in the House. I think there's a really good chance that the Senate will flip. I think that there are a lot of tough races out there, but I think when you've got a Mark Kelly, Hickenlooper, Bullock, Cunningham, you know the names. Uh, I think there's a chance that those key three four votes can flip. I really do, especially if it's a blue wave. Um, there's some interesting races. Uh, Sarah Iowa, Gideon versus Susan Collins in Maine. Yeah, that could go. That could that could be a flip, absolutely, because of um, her votes in the past year. So there are going to be some. Each one of those is a fascinating microcosm of American politics, American points of view, and the good and bad of America in 2020. You're you're absolutely right. Sheena says you described yourself when you talked about great lawyers, the people <laughs> uh, you, could Sheena. see. Ellen Thank says you. down position races are so important. I agree, Ellen. I agree. Absolutely. And and Stefan says, Mr. Barnett, thank you so much for sharing all of your incredible insight tonight. Be safe and be well. Let's hope for the best and that we can get back on track of the, the track of decency in this country with a new president. Oh uh, yeah, thank you, Stefan and Rose and Shuri. I hope we can do this again when we can look back on what happened as opposed to anticipate what might happen yeah. because that will also be a fascinating discussion. Maybe I can be episode number 437 <laughs> when I'm 98 years old. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We'll hold you to it. We will. <laughs> and, and everyone, tomorrow night, we'll be back uh, to talk about the elections. And hopefully, we'll have some idea where the results are. But we want to thank you very much, uh, Mr. Barnett. Thank you for being thank here. You. Thank you so much. And we'll say, I'll say uh, goodbye. An honor. Uh, remember, send me, send me a copy for this yeah. guy and Connor and Blair. Okay. Yes, we will do that. Uh, let we, me down. No, you'll get that tonight. Thank you Good. so much. Good. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Stay safe. Bye.